My name's Kyle Simpson. I'm Getify everywhere online, GitHub and Twitter and all the other places that matter. Uh, so you can find me there. Done a number of uh, open source projects. Uh, Lab.js is a script loader that came out a while ago. It's now entirely irrelevant, but it was important for a while. So you can check that out. I've also been recently working a lot in the area of templating. Uh, I feel very strongly and passionately about this. And so I've got a templating engine called Grips that I've just kind of finished and put out there. Uh, so you're welcome to take a look at that. That's also on my GitHub. You can get the uh, links to that from there. Uh, down at the bottom in the red, you'll see uh, links to the slides. Um, that's the part in red is the only part that you actually have to type in to, to get the slides for today. There will also be some code. I'll give that URL in a minute. In a minute. Um, but anyway, we're going to jump in and we're going to talk about uh, native HTML5 and why I think you should stop using it. And um, so let me just fully say that I understand this title is entirely link bait. Some of you probably came because you were excited that I was going to tell you why Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want to use native uh, HTML5 on mobile apps. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that. I'm actually going to talk about the opposite because I'm super passionate about JavaScript and HTML5 and kind of a snob about it, actually. Very excited about this technology. And so we're going to be talking about why you should be doing, using it and how you should be doing so uh, responsibly. Before I get to that, though, let me just do a couple of uh, house cleaning things. I have a book that came out. If you want to have a discount code off D there, that'll give you 50% off of it or something like that. So you're welcome to grab that if you don't have, already have like 15 other HTML5 books. I will be writing more in this space, so keep an eye on the HTML quote unquote five space. I'll be writing more about that soon. <clears throat> it's become in vogue for speakers to get up at conferences, especially JavaScript heavy conferences, put a giant slide with a semicolon on it so that they declare where they stand on the semicolon debate. This is where I stand on the spaces versus tabs debate. And uh, so if you're interested in where I stand, you can grab this. There is actually a character there, but it should be obvious from my code. Uh, let me take just a slight diversion to talk about this slide. This is sort of my Douglas Crockford uh, IE6 must die slide moment. Um, there's many things that I could have put in here, but I'm, I'm now talking about browser versions and why I think they need to go away. So I, I believe very strongly and passionately that our community, our industry has been fed a lie for 10 or 15 years. And that lie is that when we build something using the web platform technology, that that something should look and act and feel and behave exactly the same no matter which browser, no matter which version, no matter which settings the user figures out to set up on their, on their system. And that has been the prevailing theme that clients and bosses, I've spent the last dozen years or so in this industry having clients and bosses tell me it's got to work. Uh, you know, I had, for instance, I had a boss that told me one time that we could not use rounded corners on a dialog box, even though we wanted to. We were not allowed to use rounded corners because doing so would have required us to do the old image fallback for IE6 or some crap like that. So we literally were not allowed to make anything look cooler and better in the newer browsers because we didn't want there to be any kind of either difference or difference in technology for the older browsers. This is insane. And this is part of what's holding our industry back, I think. So the idea is basically browser versions are just an arbitrary marketing label. They don't actually mean anything. What means something is feature detection. We've had this really cool concept for a while. We don't use it enough. And actually what we need to do is retrain clients and bosses from the ground up that that's how the web works. My proof, that's how browser vendors design things. They do not design things to work and act exactly the same. They differentiate. We should be embracing that. So enough of that side note. I'll actually be giving a talk entitled Browser Versions Must Die next week back here in San Francisco at JS Everywhere. So I just wanted to give a plug for that. OK. We're going to talk about HTML5. Uh, just as a point of trivia, how many of you know uh, what these little symbols below the HTML5 logo are? Anybody know what those are? Oh, come on now. There's eight separate sort of classes or logos, if you will, that define eight separate areas of HTML5 technology. Um, generally related to JavaScript. I'm just going to refer to all of this stuff as HTML5 and friends. The reason being is I don't actually care which spec body is handling which particular version of the spec or what, whose umbrella it's under, or which guy is you know, heading up the group or the committee or something. All that politics, that's crap. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we have the technology and we can use it. So I'm just going to give it a friendly label, HTML5 and friends. Uh, by the way, these four logos, they're storage and 
performance and graphics and device APIs. And those will actually come into play a little bit later. OK, so last, I guess back in May, I was up here at HTML5 DevConf. It was at a different hotel, I think. can't even remember, actually. But um, I gave a talk on HTML5 JavaScript on crack. Was anybody at that talk? Anybody remember my talk? OK. So this will look familiar to you. Th that talk, the premise of that talk was, here is a game that I wrote. The game's called We Puzzle It. It's a multiplayer online game where you can go and um, upload images. It creates these mixed up puzzles. And then you compete against each other to solve the puzzle as quickly as possible. The whole point of that game was not to show off how awesome of a game designer I am, because clearly I am not. Clearly I'm not a graphics person. Uh, but it was to show off these HTML5 APIs woven together into a real application instead of what you typically see on the web and in every HTML5 book that's ever been written, including mine. You just see a bunch of toy examples that don't actually weave anything together. And it's left as an exercise to the reader. So this talk was conceived basically to explain, here's how we take these APIs and weave them in together into a real world application. I bring all this up to say we're not going to rehash that talk. Obviously, I'm giving a different talk. But it actually provides a really good basis for what I'm going to talk about today, because I'm going to bash my own code. So we're going to just flash back to some of the code from that particular talk, from that project. If you're interested, it's all open source. Again, you can get that off those URLs. <coughs> so this, um, this code here is, is a snippet of the code where I'm, I'm dealing with the storage API. How many of you know about session storage and local storage? OK, pretty good number of you. These APIs are exactly the same. The only difference between the APIs is how long the data is kept around. For session storage, it's kept around only for that tab session and no longer. For local storage, it's kept around forever, longer than IE6 will be around. That data will be sticking there unless you clean it up because users are not going to go into their developer tools and you know, check, check on local storage and clear it out and stuff like that. So you actually have to be very careful about the data that you stick in there. Make sure you're not just filling that up and leaving it there forever. So pretty basic. I'm setting an item. I'm getting an item, that kind of thing. Uh, these APIs are not rocket science. They're pretty straightforward. And for the most part, they're pretty stable. So there's not a huge problem with this code. But it does start to show you that you can see that I've got peppered throughout the code a bunch of different usages of this API. That's going to set us up for what we're talking about later. Uh, some more complex code. I'm starting to deal with the Canvas API. Don't be fooled by the fact that there's some uh, jQuery mixed in here. Uh, if you don't like the dollar sign, you know, fine, whatever. You can drop in a different uh, library if you want. I use jQuery just because it was simple or whatever. But uh, the bottom line here is that I'm, I'm making some calls against the Canvas API to do some operations as part of this game. In this case, on the first line, uh, it's kind of hard to see the line numbers there, but on that first line, I'm calling context.drawImage. So the Canvas has both a parent Canvas object and a context that you draw within. And so you have two different references. And the crazy part about the Canvas API is that some of the calls are on the context, and some of them are on the main one. And you have to keep that straight. So in this case, you see in the first line, I'm calling draw image against the context. But on the, that next line that you see, I'm getting a reference to the actual Canvas object to call to data URL. So it's a little bit bizarre about why, you know, why is one on one API and one on another. I'm sure there's some reason behind that. But this is another example of when you start using Canvas code across your Akashico, no, I know a lot of you probably are already using a Canvas wrapper. Um, but if you're, if you're grabbing code off of an open source project or off of a tutorial and you're just dropping it into your code, which a lot of us do, you're going to start to see a lot of this code propagate throughout your code base. So you're going to start to see a lot of these crazy Canvas calls. The next screen shows you even more some of the things I hate about the Canvas API. So here you can see I'm calling context over and over and over again, context.beginpath.drawimage.restore setting some global composite operation. Who even knows what that stuff means, right? So I'm doing all this stuff against the Canvas API. And I actually think this is a perfect example of why Douglas Crockford's wrong about the with operator in JavaScript. We still need the with operator for crap like this, because I don't really want to actually write code in production that's got context dot over and over and over again. This is ugly code. It's longer. It's harder to maintain. But this is an example of the code. And again, I'm sort of bashing my own code here. This is an example of code that I put out there six months ago. I stood up on a stage and told you guys, this is awesome code. Go use it. And this is code that I wrote. Another example, this is file reader. This actually gives you local file reading access. You can take when somebody gives you a reference to an image file, instead of uploading it to the server first and then grabbing that file back, now you can literally directly read those contents right away and do something with it, like render the image in the page. I use that a bunch in this game. So I, we have this line, 
create a new file reader, and then read his data URL. Pretty straightforward, not a very complex API as most things go. It's getting more complex though as we start to see like file system and some other things peppering in. You're going to get more and more complex file operations, but file reader is not too bad. But again, I have several places already that file reader shows up. This slide uh, shows drag and drop. How many of you have done anything with HTML5's native drag and drop? Anybody? Uh, I bet most of you had to go out drinking after you wrote that code because some really hard code to understand. It's kind of crazy. This is an example of code that I have in there where when I'm dragging a file on, Mozilla uses a different MIME type for the file that's being dragged than the other browsers do. So I have to do some code inspection, forking, crap uh, to handle this properly. This is the kind of code that I would end up sprinkling out throughout a lot of my code. And guess what happens when Firefox comes along and changes that MIME type? Now a whole bunch of my code is completely broken all over the place. Maybe I can do a find and replace, but that's going to be hard to find some of that stuff like MIME types like XMOS and stuff like that. Further down, you can see I'm, I'm doing things like getting the data transfer object and then setting a drop effect. Um, what's interesting about the drop effect here is that you might think that what you're actually doing is affecting how something behaves when it is dropped, but actually you're affecting how it behaves before it's dropped. So it's kind of a crazy, weird named API that they've got. Drag and drop's got a whole bunch of problems, so I won't bash on it for too long. But again, this is code that I wrote and put out there and said, uh, this is an example of what's awesome about HTML5. Let's all go and do this. Let's come back and see if maybe I was wrong. So I've been kind of hinting at some things, but what is so harmful about this code? What are the problems that this sort of coding practice leads to? Firstly, I want to point you to this article. Again, all you need is the stuff that's in red. I point you to this article written by Nicholas Zakis. I don't know if you guys know who he is or if you follow him, but he is awesome. Uh, definitely one of the smartest guys I know in this industry. Goes by SlickNet on Twitter. You definitely should follow him, look at his talks and stuff. He is definitely not harmful, so let me just make sure that's clear. He is not harmful, but he wrote this really good, interesting article that I was a, a tech editor on, and it was talking about the premise of this particular talk that I'm giving today. So he's the inspiration behind uh, this talk and behind the code that I'll be showing you later. Some things that are harmful about writing code like the code I've been showing you, writing code against these native APIs. For one thing, specs. There are a whole bunch of different specs, and just within the last couple of weeks, it got even worse again because now we've seen a split where there's W3C and Ian's whatever group his, he's got going on, and, and, and now there's a split again, and we've got different committees dealing with things. Remember I said earlier, I actually don't care about any of that stuff. That's because I've actually dealt with those politics, and it sucks. Dealing with the politics of who's handling what and who owns what part of what spec and things like that is terrible for developers. How many of you have ever opened up the HTML5 spec and read through any substantial portion of it? More than I expected, probably you know a dozen or two of you, uh, that's more than I expected. I open it up every single night. It's good night reading right before I go to bed. Um, it's boring, it's hard, it's confusing. They do have an HTML developer's edition that's better. Uh, but, there, but then that's just one of the versions of the spec. And you can actually read the, the other version of the spec alongside it and see that they don't always agree on stuff. So then you're like, well, now what am I supposed to do? Uh, there's all kinds of specs and the, it's not going to change. The specs are going to continue to uh, morph themselves. They're going to continue to be politics, politics driving these things. So one of the problems with things is that we have this duality in our industry. And, and by industry, I mean the browser vendor industry. We have this duality that says sometimes the browsers just decide to implement something really cool because they think we should have it. And then they come back later and get the specs to codify what they've agreed on. And sometimes they sit around and say, no, we're paralyzed. We can't do anything until we have a spec body come along and tell us exactly what it should look like letter by letter. That's usually because there's been some infighting behind the scenes on some mailing list that we're not on that shows why WebKit and Microsoft don't agree on something. So <clears throat> we actually can't really put our finger on what's going to happen with this technology based upon what's happening in the spec. Sometimes what the spec says is where we're going, and sometimes the spec says where we're already been. And so it's kind of hard to figure out. And, and I worked for Mozilla for like eight or nine months, and I still couldn't figure it out. So this is hard. This is hard, and it's really hard for developers that don't have skin in this game. If you're not participating on these lists, how are you ever going to keep up with all the politics and stuff? Specs make this hard. Another example, uh, there are just plain bugs. There are simply bugs that happen all over the place. And un as unfortunate it is, as it is, sometimes those bugs don't 
get addressed. I actually found a bug that I was really bothered by, had something to do with the rounded corners and border radius and background clip or something like that, I think. And this, this bug was actually affecting a, a piece of code that I wrote for one of my clients recently. And I found that this bug had been filed back in 2009 against WebKit and against Chrome. And it had not been addressed since 2009. And it seemed like such a stupid, simple thing. It's very clear that it's a bug because the spec is very clear on how it should behave. And yet they didn't address it. And for a while, there was even some hemming and hawing about whether or not that was a valid bug to address. So this is crazy the way bugs kind of, again, some of that politics, the way these bugs play out. Sometimes you'll file a bug and it'll be fixed in like 18 seconds by some WebKit developer. And sometimes it can take years to address these things. So another part of the problem is that we end up writing a whole bunch of code to get ourselves around it because our client's not going to sit around and wait for that bug to get addressed, especially if it's going to take a really long time. Prefixes. How many of you ex enjoy or are excited about writing uh, vendor prefixes either in your CSS or in your JavaScript? Is there anybody? I thought maybe I'd get one or two like gluttons for punishment. But for the rest of the world, this sucks, writing all these vendor prefixes. And let me give you an example of why it really sucks. There was a library that I was dealing with. I won't name them, um, but they're really popular, so you probably know them. They were going the step of adding automatically, do it, you would specify a CSS rule that you wanted to apply, and they would automatically go in and add in all the vendor prefixes, and they were doing some you know, feature tests and stuff. Sounds really helpful, right? Except they neglected to realize that there are some places where you not only have to prefix the rule name, but you also have to prefix the value. And they were not prefixing the value. And so in those cases, it was completely borked and broken. And I pointed this out to them, and we started talking about this stuff, and then they realized, wow, this is actually really hard. How do we know in what cases are we going to have to prefix the value? That's an even harder level of having to prefix this stuff. So this, it's a reality. And I don't care where you stand on the politics of should we have vendor prefixes or should we not. It's undeniable that it's pushed a lot of technology out there fast and it's gotten a lot of good stuff out there. But you know, it does sort of hamper us. It does sort of handcuff us from time to time. It certainly makes our code harder. It's an argument for why we use things like SAS and LESS and other things like that. But it's even true in JavaScript. We have vendor prefixing on a lot of these APIs. So you have to, re and the capitalization's different. So you have to remember if it's Moz request animation API or WebKit capital R request. It's crazy stuff. Vendor prefixes are a reality, but they make this really hard to manage. Progress. Progress is a really good thing, but it can also be a really bad thing. Uh, and, and by that, what I mean is we just found out a couple of weeks ago that they've changed their mind. First, they said that HTML5 was all that it was ever going to be. And now they've come around and they said, well, actually, we're going to finish HTML5 the end of 2014. And that's actually how many seconds from now it is until the end of 2014. Uh, we're going to finish HTML5.0, and then we'll have HTML5.1. And so every few weeks, this changes. We don't know what it's called. But we're constantly adding in all this cool stuff. So that's the good side. We're constantly adding in all these new features. But then there was this list of stuff that came out recently, like features that I've actually written into production apps that they're not sure if it's going to make it into HTML5. And I'm like, it doesn't matter if it makes it, because it's already in every browser, and it's already in tons of people's code. So again, this draw between what's happening in the real world and what's happening in the politics of these processes makes this kind of stuff really hard to deal with. Another example, I'll pick on Canvas a, a number of times today. So uh, if that hurts your feelings, I'm sorry about that. But um, verbosity is an example of things that make coding against these APIs really hard. For example, request animation frame. What a really, like, I mean, it's very descriptive. That's helpful. But who on earth wants, I mean, people alias this stuff all the time because nobody actually wants to write request animation frame a thousand times throughout their code. And you're going to misspell something. I, for some reason, I always misspell the word animation, something weird with my brain. So I'm going to misspell it all the time, and I'm going to miss the capitalization, things like that. Canvas, another example, you have to repeat yourself over and over again. I have this basic theory that the more times you have to repeat yourself, the more chances there are for you to screw it up. Up. So the more verbose these APIs are, the more chances there are for me to write bad code or write buggy code. Sometimes it's easy to find those, and sometimes it's really hard. So what are some answers? Well, the basic answer that a lot of developers know in the back of their head, but they have not applied to this particular area, and it's the reason why I'm giving this talk, is the idea of wrapping a very thin layer of abstraction called a facade around these APIs. Why do you do that? The reason you do that is because all those problems that I just talked about, 
you contain all of the fixing of those things to one area. It's very similar to why jQuery in its early days, Dojo in its early days, they were containing all of the craziness of cross-browser DOM management into one location, so they were, only had to fix bugs once, and you didn't have to go and change your code whenever they, a new browser version came out or they fixed some new bug that had been found. So it's a similar concept to that. We want to make sure that we give ourselves a little bit of buffer or a little bit of um, space between the code that we're writing all day, every day, throughout all of our code base, and this code that's really susceptible to all these problems. Let's give ourselves just this little safety area, this DMZ, if you will, and that's what we're doing with facades. So I undertook the idea, after being inspired again by Zekas, I undertook the idea that said, what we need is a set of HTML5 API facades for all the APIs that are there, plus all the dozens more that are coming. And that's actually a pretty daunting list. We'll see that at the end. That's a daunting list of APIs that we are going to have to deal with, but we need to actually have APIs on all of that stuff because every one of them, no matter how stable you think it is, XHR has been around for a really long time. Guess what? It just changed. They added a bunch of stuff to it. So even old stuff that's really stable is still going to change. It's still subject to change. So we need facades around all these things, and I thought, okay, I'll write a framework. Now, I understand fully that when you write uh, a framework, you get into the, everybody wants to reinvent everything. And I'm actually the anti-framework guy. A number of my talks I get up and say, Fram frameworks are bad, frameworks are evil, they try to do too much for you and try to be too automagical and, and so forth. So, so let me just say I understand that there's a little bit of irony here in me, in me saying let's create a, a singular set of these API facades. And, and, and I want to try to distinguish between what I would call framework development and what I'm calling facade development. So let's look a little bit at that. First, I love this quote. This actually, the more I see this quote, the more it permeates other areas of my life, like politics and religion and all these other things. Um, but definitely inside of coding, this, uh, this really informs the way I approach development. Perfection's achieved not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. When it's at its simplest, the essence of something that is perfect, the essence of something that's exactly what it should be, no more and no less, it's just like Goldilocks, it's exactly the right amount. That's what we're going for, and I know that's this mythical thing that sounds great in theory and it's really hard in practice, but that's what we're going for with this design. So we want not too much and not too little with the facades that we're developing. Definitely want to make sure that these things are modular. It's really important that you do not force somebody to download you know, 25, 93K worth of code just because they want to do Ajax. I know that that was awesome with jQuery when we came out and everybody just started loading jQuery, but if all you're doing is Ajax, you're, uh, you're loading a whole bunch of unnecessary code. Thankfully, they, all of the major frameworks, they're all much more modular now, so that's a good thing. But we want to start from that premise that says no interdependencies if we can avoid it, and we want to make sure that you can choose. If I'm only using three of the 50 HTML5 APIs, I'll just use those modules. So we'll give you a build tool for this framework and, and so forth, and we'll let you choose which modules you need. It's okay to put some sugar into these APIs. We're not going to go quite as far and quite as crazy as creating you know, really uh, complex and esoteric DSLs inside of the language and things like that. But I'm informed by things like chaining in jQuery. I think there's some actually some really elegant code that that can produce in used in moderation. So chaining and some other simple sugar like that, maybe combining some operations. There's some value there, but we want to make sure we're doing so in a very restrained way because the purpose of the facade is not to show off how good we are at designing better APIs. Let me make, say it again. We're not trying to show off how much better we are than the, than the spec at designing APIs. Now, I would like to fancy myself as being okay at that, but I'm, I'm, that's not the point of this project. So we want to make sure that the sugar doesn't get in the way, it doesn't become the focus, and certainly we don't want extra weight and code and bloat and certainly performance problems that bog things down just because we can make prettier code out of it. So we do want to do some sugar, but not too much. Oops. The other thing I want to point out is that <clears throat> in the world of uh, JavaScript, there, there's these these terms, shims and polyfills, I'm sure you guys have heard these things. Um, an example, HTML5 video. Everybody knows it's awesome. Everybody knows it doesn't exist on IE8 and below. And so what do we do? We use these really complex media players that use HTML5 and then they fall back to the Flash video player and they try to create you exactly the same API. That's an example of a polyfill or shim. What those things are doing is taking 
new functionality that we currently benefit from and putting it into places that that functionality does not currently exist, i.e. the old browsers, the old browsers that are taking forever to go away and die in a fire. Um, so, <clears throat> so what we want to do is make sure that we be more restrained because the world of writing polyfills and shims is a world fraught with all kinds of landmines. And I've actually walked through that world when I was dealing with script loaders, dealing with LabJS writing and so forth, trying to make sure that all the script loading, all the weird craziness that happens there, uh, if, if you're interested in that, you can read. There's a whole bunch of stuff I've written about that. But, but dealing with old browsers and dealing with bugs and craziness and trying to polyfill behavior into old browsers, A, is really hard, and B, it's not something that I should decide how that works for you. I don't want to go and create a polyfill for you because the decisions that I make about how that video experience should happen in the fallback are my opinions. They may not be your opinions. So I'm not going to create fallbacks for you, but I will empower you to go and put in your own fallbacks and your own um, polyfills and shims on top of things if you so choose. And if you so choose, as I said earlier with browser versions, maybe you could just leave that stuff out and just let stuff start to gradually die away, those old plug-in you know, fallbacks that we used to do, like the fallback for Canvas and Flash and all those things. Maybe we can just start to let those things die a little bit. Um, this is a really important role that's going to inform a whole lot of things that we do with the design of these facades. We are not going to try to uh, solve every single piece of every single API. There's a whole bunch of crazy complexity, for instance, in Canvas, like, uh, you know, the, I don't even know those Bezier quadratic curve crap. I've never written Bezier quadratic curve. Maybe some of you have, but that's an example of an API that's definitely not in the 80% use case. It's definitely one of those very niche use cases. There's no reason for us to spend our, a bunch of time and effort and create a bunch of bloat for an API that's way off in those niche cases. So what we're going to do is try to identify, and this is somewhat subjective, but identify the core area, if you will, that is 80% use case. And then the 20% use case will allow you to fall back to the raw behavior. So let me say that again. What we're going to do is create a facade that solves or wraps 80% use case of an API. And then those 20% use cases that are not so common and maybe are more complicated or more difficult or more error prone or even just newer and there's still a lot of churn happening with them, we'll leave those things alone for now until such a time as something like that becomes really common. If people start writing quadratic Bezier curves, all over the place, then maybe we'll put that into the API. Uh, but there's, a, there's actually a reason for why I want to do it this way, because in, you'll see if you take a look at the code I suggest in a moment, you'll see that in the cases where you're falling back to that old behavior, I use, they call it now dunder, the underscore underscore raw is how I expose the underlying raw API. Well, guess what happens when you have bugs that show up in your code? What I'm going to do is do a find for underscore underscore raw because it's probably a good chance that it starts there. So it makes it actually easier for you to figure out the places where you need to go in and inspect your code that aren't wrapped by these facades. I mentioned bugs earlier. We are going to try to fix bugs, but we are going to, again, be restrained in doing so because bugs can actually take you down a crazy rabbit trail. If you've ever looked at the jQuery source code, you know there's a whole bunch of things that jQuery is doing for IE6 that actually are bloating and complicating, you know, weird stuff about how attributes versus properties are handled and, and so forth, and they're trying to fix these bugs. But then they end up actually painting themselves into a corner and making a decision about how something should work in one particular case. And so you actually end up creating gotchas for developers. When IE6's documentation differs from the way jQuery actually normalizes the behavior of an attribute and property, you've created a foot gun, you've created a landmine that some developer is going to trip over someday. So we want to make sure if we're going to fix a bug, there needs to be a very clear path and it needs to be clear and obvious that we're fixing it in a standardized way. If we're getting into sort of arbitrary ways that we think things should be fixed or you know, polyfilled, if you will, if we're getting into that sort of thing, we should walk away from that. That's not the kind of bug that we want to fix with the facade. That's something a higher level of code can come back and wrap on top if, you, if really necessary. Same goes for quirks. Now, there's a fine distinction between bugs and quirks, so I could have probably just put this on, on the same slide. But uh, for example, Canvas, again, I'm picking on Canvas. Canvas has 
uh, this weird behavior, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen, you know, somebody puts out a blog post and they draw this really cool, awesome looking geometric pattern using Canvas. And, and I got into the habit of every time I saw one of those, I would open it up in several different browsers like Chrome, Safari, and Firefox, and so forth. Just because I wanted to see that this was actually happening a lot, you, you'll notice almost every one of those, you'll open it in two or three browsers and it looks awesome, and then you'll open it in another browser, which is still a very modern and standards-based browser. And Canvas, by the way, has been around for more than a decade, so we should know very clearly how Canvas should be working. Uh, but then it'll be weird. There'll be some crazy line just going diagonally off the screen. Like, it's the same code. Why is it doing that? Well, there's quirks there because in some cases, if you do not set, if you don't move to 0, 0 before you draw a line, in some browsers it will assume that you meant to, and in some browsers it won't. Is that handled in the spec? I don't know because I actually don't care that much about the Canvas spec. But uh, in some cases, these things are just quirks where it's poorly or underdefined, and we don't actually know how it should behave. Well, in, in those cases, we can actually try, again, if, if we're not creeping too far into the, the proprietary, weird deciding how the world should be, if we can fix one of those quirks, like if every single other browser and every single other implementation of Canvas assumes the 0, zero move and Chrome doesn't assume the 0, zero move, we can fix that quirk. And I don't have to call it a bug. I don't even have to file a bug against it because they're probably going to ignore it for three years. But I can smooth out that quirk very simple and very easy, and we're not setting too much of a landmine for ourselves. So we do want to make sure we can smooth out quirks, but again, being very restrained in doing so. Again, picking on Canvas, but there are other APIs that suffer this too. HTML5 drag and drop is one, as I mentioned earlier, with the, the, the drop effect copy and all of that stuff. There are cases where the API designers, for some strange reason, I don't know if they were on some sort of drug or what, but they designed an API that was opposite of the conceptual thing that was happening when you called that API. For example, inside of Canvas, and you've probably seen this whenever you've gone to any kind of tutorial site out on the web, and you've looked at something that describes the transforms that you can do, rotating uh, your Canvas and scaling your Canvas and so forth. And even in the words that I just used right there, I betrayed exactly what happens on the web. People talk about it as rotating and scaling your Canvas. So you think, OK, I draw it, and then after I've drawn it, then I rotate it. And then you start writing your code and you're saying, wait, is it counterclockwise or clockwise? Because I can't understand why it rotates opposite of the way I wanted it to. And the problem is the conceptual, because you're not actually rotating the canvas. You're rotating the coordinate system before it's drawn. And that creates an opposite effect if you're not paying attention. So when you see all these tutorials out there and you see the API for rotating and so forth, they don't make it clear at all. Nobody makes it clear that you're actually dealing with transforming the coordinate system. They talk about transforming the canvas. And that causes developers to get this stuff backwards all the time. So this is an opportunity where we can fix those conceptuals and make an API that actually maps to what's happening. Another example, the state, saving state and, and restoring state inside of canvas. How many of you have written much Canvas code and are all familiar with the API? Not very many of you, okay. Not surprising. Inside of Canvas, there's a call that you can make, again on the context object, called dot .save. Now how many of you um, believe that dot .save would do something like saving out the bitmap data in some way, shape, or form, like taking a snapshot of that Canvas? Anybody? Yeah, I, I certainly did. For like months, I was writing against this and thinking that save was like getting a snapshot. That's not what it is. Save actually has to deal with saving the state of what's in your canvas into a queue, into a stack, actually. And then you call restore when you want to restore that state back from this. So there's a conceptual problem here. And in computer science, for 20 years or more, we've had a name for this. It's called stack, pushing state and popping state. Why didn't they call it that? I don't know. But this is an example where we can fix that conceptual. We can make it very clear with the API that what you're doing is pushing the state and popping the state. And if you know anything at all about development, you'll understand the concept of pushing and popping. So again, very simple changes that we can make to help clear up some of the conceptuals. So talked a whole lot about some of my design principles. It's OK if you completely disagree with those design principles. That's cool. Go start your own project. But for my project, let's take a look at some of this code. The code for today, if you want to go and take a look, project's called H5. And this will direct you to the GitHub repo, and you can take a look at that code. But we'll take a look at several of the APIs that have already started been working on. So I talked about storage earlier. I mentioned that you have the storage API where you set items and get items and delete items. 
And I said that the primary difference between the local storage and the system storage was just how long does that data stick around. This is one of those examples, I think, conceptually, where we can make the API simpler by combining those two into the same API so that when you instantiate the API, you tell it how long you want the data to stick around. So you don't see it actually uh, terribly. It's further up in this code, and I can show you this uh, later at the end of the talk. But when you instantiate an object here, I've called my object session. But when you instantiate it, you say, I want it to stick around for the session only. Or I want it to stick around for X number of milliseconds or to an expiration date. That's something that the API doesn't directly give you, but a lot of people end up writing their own wrappers for. Why not go ahead and codify that? So we've done so and given you a way to have very direct and easy control over how long that data sticks around. Hopefully that will lead to more responsible management of data on the user end systems. I know it doesn't seem like a, a bad problem, but you can actually start to have some runaway memory usage conditions in certain browsers if you're just constantly writing out new keys and never cleaning those things up. So we can maybe be a little bit more responsible if we have an API that makes it direct. We can explicitly say how long we want the data to stick around. Oh, by the way, let me just mention that the way I went about developing these APIs so far with, with H5 and, and the thing that I would implore the community to help with is I, I did what I called example-driven development. This is the API that I would use. This was, I sat down and I said, okay, an empty file, what would I like for an API dealing with sessions and dealing with local storage and stuff? What would I would like for that to look like? Just created an API, and then I went back and backfilled that with some code to make that work. So we start out with what we want it to look like, and that gives us an opportunity to examine the problems that we do want to fix and the ones that we don't want to fix because they're not restrained enough. So that was the previous slide was what I wanted to look like. This is just an example of what it looks like underneath the covers. You can see in this particular example, I have this H5 colon data and expires thing. That's my wrapping around the data that you're storing so that we can provide expiration dates for it. Whenever you read out a value, if it's already been expired, it just silently deletes it for you and returns nothing. It's pretty straightforward. This is not rocket science that I created this concept, but putting it into a nice, simple facade actually helps a lot of people remove that abstraction from other places in their code. All right, let's look at XHR for a moment. Now, XHR is an API that has been wrapped probably a billion times. Everybody's written their own. I've written three or four myself. Um, I'm not trying to come along and say, I am the best API designer. Remember, I said that earlier. I'm not trying to show off my API design skills. I just took some cues from some of the other ones. Again, we talked about sort of chaining. That's kind of nice in jQuery, and it helps us not to have to repeat the object over and over. So pretty straightforward. I've got error you know, for the error handler, um, progress, and success. This API has a bunch of other stuff that we could add into it. There's a whole bunch of things that XHR2 now does, like handling of uploading of files directly. You can do that. You can upload. You can create form data objects and upload those directly, almost exactly like you had done a normal form post. So some really cool stuff that XHR2 now has. And that code is actually really, it's really hard if you go and look, look online right now to try to figure out how to do that correctly. It's actually really hard to figure that out. So be, that's a good candidate for something that should be wrapped up in this API. Definitely need to do more work with XHR, but you can see the basics are there right now. It's not rocket science, as I said before. You can see I'm just calling xhr.open and .set request header. We're not doing anything really complicated or, or magical here. We're just calling those APIs the way they were meant to be called, but providing a saner API on top of it and giving ourselves that sort of buffer um, of protection in case something wonky goes, goes wrong. Canvas, okay, so I bashed on Canvas for this entire talk. Here's how I might approach fixing Canvas. This is not, again, the end all be all. This isn't uh, designed to say this is the perfect API for Canvas. But a number of the problems that I complained about with Canvas can be solved. Chaining does away with the, net, the need for all that context dot or using the with operator. Uh, you'll notice that I've got rect and I'm providing a parameter called fill. Well, that. I'll, that's pretty straightforward and simple conceptual that if I'm drawing a rectangle, I want to draw a solid color rectangle. In Canvas, you have to do that as two separate operations. You have to draw the rectangle, and then you have to tell the rectangle to fill. Why not make that one operation? And in fact, why not make it one operation for you to do both the filling and the stroking of creating a border on it? It's pretty straightforward conceptual, so this API allows you to do that. You'll see pop state in there. I've got push state and pop state, again, solving that problem, defining segments and so forth. Again. This is an open source community project, and if you think I've done a terrible job designing this API, please come in and suggest a better one. But I just started trying to create something that moves the ball a little bit forward and gives me a saner way of working against Canvas. 
Again, some of the underlying code. You'll notice that there towards the very bottom, I'm just doing, I'm calling the context object, and I've got a type of method that I'm calling against it, like arc or line two or whatever, and I'm just applying it and passing in the parameter. So again, nothing magic will happen. This is another fun one. How many of you know what get user media is? Okay, good. Get user media is actually one of my, my, the APIs that I'm most excited about in all of HTML5. We actually have direct access to the webcam and the microphone from the browser now. I think that's awesome. Instead of having to le rely on all this crazy weird fallbacks that we had to do with Flash and so forth, and all the you know, floating, hovering, transparent buttons and all that other crap, now we have direct access from JavaScript. And it's, it couldn't be any simpler. Get user media, we just want to get a stream of video, and then we can attach it to a video tag or an audio tag or whatever. Well, we created a very simple facade, because there's not a lot of complexity here. Create a very simple facade where we get the user media, and we tell it what kind of stream we want, video, and then we wait for that stream to finish, and then once we have that, we can attach it to a video tag. Now, I, I did this on purpose because I don't have a video module yet, but if I had a video module, I wouldn't have to do that document.getElementById crap that I'm doing there. I could just create an instance of the video module and attach it. And I could probably create some really nice, easy ways that you can pass one object to another without too much interdependence between the modules. And then again, error fallbacks are pretty straightforward. Underneath the covers, there is actually some kind of crazy complexity that we do want to wrap. So one of them is um, all the nuts vendor prefixing that's happening. And you can't see that on this screen. I'll show that later. But there's all kinds of weirdness around the vendor prefixing. But you can see here, actually, one of the weirdnesses is that GUM is my get user media reference object that I've you know, I've done my detection against the vendor prefixes for. And then I'm looping through an option hash and creating a string out of it or some crazy thing like that. Why am I doing that? Well, some browsers require the parameter to get user media to be a string that's common delimited, and some of them require an object hash. Why? I don't know, just because they wanted to screw with us. But this is the example, the kind of thing that needs to be wrapped up in a facade, because you definitely don't want to be doing that kind of low-level detail code throughout all of your project. And finally, request animation frame is another one of the modules we've created. How many of you know what request animation frame does? More of you, good, okay. So it's the better set timeout, which is sort of the marketing way of saying it's a, it's a better, more performant version of setting up an asynchronous task to happen at a very specific interval of time. In this case, you don't give it a number of milliseconds. What you do is you tell the browser, I have a set of tasks that I want to do, and I'm telling you that these tasks have something to do with changing the visual layout of the page. So what I want you to do, browser, is the next time you're about ready to paint the new page, before you do that, call my function so that I can make some changes before you do that. And that may be 16 milliseconds from now or 32 milliseconds from now or whatever, but on this device, the very next time you're about to draw something to the screen, do my stuff first, batch it all up together and make it a nice, pretty easy, single, efficient operation instead of what happens now where these kind of things can be you know, threaded and some of them are batched together and some of them are not. So request animation frame actually makes, it's not just about making things run faster, but it's actually making a lot less stuff have to happen. The browser doesn't have to recalculate it three or four or 15 times, can just do it once if you use it properly. Well, this is a great API, and there's another sort of companion one that IE10 came out with called Set Immediate. It's got a different set of use cases, but very similar. But these are APIs that are, we, we should be using them across all of our code, but you should not be writing that long request animation frame crap, and you definitely shouldn't be doing it, because as you'll see in just a moment, the vendor prefixing of this stuff is horrible. But before we go on to that slide, I just want to show this is the API that I created for it. So again, I took an opportunity to fix one of the conceptual problems of um, of request animation frame because I'm not really requesting a frame. I think it's a poorly named API. What I'm actually doing is saying, I want you to queue up some behavior for when the next animation frame is about ready to paint. So I'm using the queue terminology. So I'm queuing up some functions to happen at certain times. And actually, there's another interesting thing here. Uh, a lot of people have not, I guess, maybe run into this. I run into this in my code all the time. There's the concept of request animation frame, which says I want something to happen at the very next animation frame. But then there are some cases where you need to have something happen then, and then you need to have something happen on the next animation frame after that. 
So you actually need request animation frame and request next animation frame. Why? For example, if you're making, if you're showing an element and then having an element slide along with a transition, you can't say display block and transition at the same time, or guess what will happen? It'll just pop up in the new location. It doesn't pop up and move like you want it to. So you have to, in one animation frame, show it, and in the very next animation frame, as quickly as possible, tell it to go ahead and transition and move itself. So we have Q and Q after to handle that. Here's what I'm talking about. Look at that vendor prefixing crap. How many, like, that, that's just insane that we have to do that kind of code to test for these things. But you'll see that in, in the second case for cancel animation frame, it's hard to see off the, off the thing. But sometimes in some browsers, they called it cancel animation frame. And sometimes they called it cancel request animation frame. Why? Who knows? This is definitely the kind of code that we want to wrap up. OK, so what are some of the things that are left? There's actually a whole bunch of stuff left. And so what I want you to hear from me is a couple things. I really want for help from the community to make these APIs better and to do some of this stuff. I don't, I don't know about some of these things like blob URLs. I've never used those before. And I don't know how to do some of that stuff. But I know there are developers that have. And I would like help from the community to develop safe and simple and sane wrapper facades around these APIs. But I also want you to, this is the bigger message that I'm getting here. I'm not pitching some project solely. What I'm pitching is the concept that facades are important and necessary for robust, safe HTML5 code. Let me say that again. They are necessary for robust HTML5 code. It's not an option. If you are writing HTML5 code in production right now, today I want you to go home and start using a facade. You can choose to use mine if you'd like. Or you can write your own. I've shown you how easy it is to write your own. But you should be wrapping up these abstractions and using facades. Don't write another blog post where you put out there a whole bunch of native HTML5 code that you're using in a whole bunch of code examples and give people more fodder for copy and pasting and creating bad code. That's going to hurt our industry. That's going to hold us back. It's time that we get more serious about creating robust code. Great question. The question is, how do you determine? I remember said 80% versus 20%. How do you determine that 80? Completely subjective at this point. But that's why I'm asking for the community to help. We need to take a look at what people are doing, what are the common code patterns. And if a case can be made that something needs to happen in the API, we'll do so. But if the case can be made, that's really kind of a niche corner case. Or there's too, complexity, too much complexity, too many landmines, then we'll avoid it. Great question. Yeah, so you actually asked two questions. The first one is, how do you go about designing APIs? And the second one is, how do you avoid the pitfalls that have already happened with the API designers? First one's a little bit easier, because I've put up some contribution guidelines, if you will. I would like for people to do example-driven development. So fork the repository and put up a module where you are showing nothing but the example code as you would like for it to work. That's one example of how you can go about it. Um, there's others, but you know that's one example. How do we avoid the pitfalls? I think that the community can be better at this than a committee can. And, and I know that may be a little bit of a cop out, but I believe the collective intelligence, the collective experience that we have, just within this room, I think we can design better APIs than some of the browser vendors have come up with. So how do we avoid those APIs? We make sure that we keep as thin as possible, as restrained as possible, a, a small a surface area for there to be problems and conflicts as possible. And we make sure that we are constantly keeping it updated. We're constantly helping do that work for the betterment of the greater community. Good question. The question was, have I created any hooks in the library so far that make it easier for you to provide those shims and polyfills and fallbacks if you so ch choose? And I would say the answer to that is my, my goal for the way we design these APIs is that they are easily wrappable. I don't think that there's a whole lot of need for you to create in you know, deep hooks into these code if you can make it easily wrappable. So my, my, my hope and my goal is that the people that like to write polyfills and shims, that they could find this code very easy to wrap around um, and provide, you know, they'll provide their own APIs. Again, I'm not trying to win some kind of beauty contest about my API. It's just trying to move the ball forward. And so I, I do think that um, we can get a lot of that done by wrapping. If there are cases where we can't, and we'll certainly address that, because I'm not trying to trip people up. I do, however, think that we should try to avoid some of that fallback mentality um, and try to live more in the present. But good questions. I see other people filtering in. My time's probably done. So thank you guys very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask.